Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. Ray Bradbury's classic 1953 novel, Fahrenheit 451, tells the story of a fictional society in which books are not read, but burned, and the populace is distracted by television and radio. In this dystopian world, reading books is outlawed to prevent the public from thinking independently, and firemen are employed to burn the remaining books in the quest to rid the world of all literature. Bradbury himself insists the story is about the replacement of book reading by television and other forms of media, and the effect these modern media have on reducing the level of discourse and independent thought in society. Still, the book is more commonly read more literally as an allegory for the ills of state-sponsored censorship. Ironic, then, that Fahrenheit 451 itself has been banned from school libraries numerous times over the years. Two weeks ago at Caney Creek High School, a 10th grade English class was given Fahrenheit 451 as a reading assignment, but Diana Verm stopped after a few pages. What do you find objectionable about it? The cussing in it and then the burning of the Bible. But the burning of a lot of other books, too. Right. She complained to her father she was given an alternate reading assignment, but her dad is pushing the issue. It is ironic in the true sense of the word that a fictional book on book banning is now the target of a request to remove it from school curriculum. Less well known than these ironic acts of censorship that arise in the public school system, however, although arguably much more ominous, are the ways that the book publishing industry itself is becoming more and more con concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer media moguls. In this process, the ease with which political and governmental bodies have been able to block the publication of books that are uncomfortable to the Washington elite, and even to destroy entire print runs of tell-all whistleblower stories, has greatly increased. Simultaneously, Books that fulfill a social function of rallying the populace around the flag and supporting the dominant narratives of our time, from the war on terror to the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, are given copious attention by a fawning lapdog press. Earlier this year, Navy SEAL Chris Kyle released his autobiography, an account of his years as a sniper in combat. Published by William Morrow and Company, an imprint of Rupert Murdoch-owned HarperCollins, Kyle's title of the deadliest sniper in U.S. military history, with 150 kills to his name, glorifying the entire American military combat experience as it did, was given glowing praise and wall-to-wall -wall media coverage in the controlled corporate press. So, we've got this new book, American Sniper. Isn't that kind of not done amongst you special operations guys to talk about your, your, your stuff? The book is a huge success and fascinating. Uh, you uh, talk about uh, your time as a member of SEAL Team 3. He is the most lethal Navy yes. SEAL sniper in American history. I'm talking about Chris Kyle. He has over 150 kills in his four tours in Iraq. Documents it all in a brand new book that you have to get called American Sniper. Last night, he sat down with Bill O'Reilly to talk about his experiences. That the feel-good, flag-waving heroics of a Navy SEAL who brags about slaughtering Iraqis in a turkey shoot from hundreds of yards away is portrayed as wholesome family entertainment on primetime and late-night TV should come as no surprise to those who, like Bradbury, realize the stultifying, lowest common denominator effects of television as a medium. That Kyle's book is heavily promoted by the very television stations owned by the same media mogul who controls the book's publishing company should come as no surprise to those who are aware of the spider's web of connections that guarantee that 90% of the American media are owned by the same few corporations. More surprising and insidious altogether, however, are the ways that people of questionable morality, and even outright criminals, are allowed to not only flaunt their criminality in the corporate media-sanctioned books published and promoted by the big-name media moguls, but to actively profit from their admissions of guilt. Such is the case of Jose Rodriguez, an ex-CIA agent who has just released a new book, Hard Measures, How Aggressive CIA Actions After 9-11 Saved American Lives. As Glenn Greenwald notes in a recent article, particularly galling about this ode to torture is the fact that this is the same Jose Rodriguez who made the decision to destroy 92 videotapes of CIA torture practices that numerous federal courts and even the 9-11 Commission had ordered the CIA to produce. When 9-11 Commission co-chairs Kane and Hamilton discovered the destruction, 
they wrote a New York Times op-ed outright accusing the CIA, and thus Rodriguez, of the criminal offense of obstruction of justice. Still, no punishment of any kind was handed down by Judge Alvin Hellerstein, who himself had ordered the CIA to produce the tapes. Now, Rodriguez is profiting from a book in which he actively and aggressively defends his decision to break the law by destroying those tapes. Still, Rodriguez is given the full court press for his new book launch, and what little pushback he gets during interviews is of the jocular, non-threatening variety that is destined to cause just enough controversy to increase book sales. So where'd you take him? So we took him to a black site. Where? <laughs> Everybody knows. Why can't you say that, that, it? It's Thailand. Uh, Why can't you say it? That is a secret I will take to my grave. Yeah, I but will never reveal the it's been location. Put, it's out there. It's all over the place. Not disclosed to viewers of the 60 Minutes piece on Rodriguez is that the Simon & Schuster imprint that publishes Rodriguez's boastful criminal confession is owned by the same CBS corporation that broadcasts 60 Minutes. Even more worrying than these puff pieces, however, is the ways that books that would threaten the status quo rather than support it are effectively suppressed. Last year, ex-FBI agent Ali Soufan attempted to publish a book critiquing the CIA's use of torture techniques in the so-called War on Terror and the decision to withhold information on two of the alleged 9-11 hijackers openly living in the U.S. for a year before the attack from the FBI. In return, the CIA launched an all-out attack on Soufan's book, attempting to cut and redact significant portions of the book that they called classified, but were in fact part of the public record. In perhaps the most saying. alarming I, example, the Pentagon literally burned sudden, the entire first print saying, run of hey, Operation Darkheart, the tell-all book and of Lieutenant book Colonel Anthony Schaefer, a U.S. Army intelligence there. officer who attempted to blow the whistle on Able Danger, a data mining program employed by the Defense Intelligence Agency, which has been alleged to have identified and let go alleged 9-11 lead hijacker Mohamed Atta one year before the attacks. The Pentagon has ordered the destruction of almost 10,000 copies of memoirs by a former intelligence officer involved in the Afghanistan campaign. The Defense Department called the book a threat to America's national security. A revised edition has since been published. And earlier, the author, Anthony Schaffer, told RT the first version of the memoirs was banned when information backing up his claims emerged. Earlier today, I had the chance to talk to Sibel Edmonds, famed FBI whistleblower and author of the tell-all memoir Classified Woman, about her own experience attempting to publish her book in the mainstream press. And then I decided after uh, I came back to the United States in 2009 that uh, it was time for me to write this book, and I did. And I wrote the manuscript, and I, I had to, unfortunately, submit it to the FBI, but also, I went about getting it published. So I was told, this is how you publish a book. You have to go and get a high-flying elite agent, you know, the Manhattan uptown kind. And then that agent will go and pitch it to these publishers, say the top five. Basically, the top three, four own the rest. <laughs> they have consolidated to such degrees that there are only like three, four top. But they are dying, and I will get to that. They are a dying breed, and they won't be around for, for, for very long. And uh, so I wanted to investigate the environment. So without actually committing, I started getting into this, um, the whole arena of publication. And, um, and soon I realized, wow, it, this is this, um, it's its own uh, kind of a scandalous uh, 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 sphere, <laughs> the publication. As you know, it's the same as the mainstream media. These are the large, big corporations-owned publication houses. They have their own politics going. Uh, they, they, they do have their connections with our intelligence agencies, and these are some of them very intimate relationships. So, and then there's also this partisanship, the, the partisan element. And there was before even this woman, she didn't become my agent, of course, after this particular conversation, said, well, you need to know how to play the game. And I said, I'm not going to play a game. I want to publish a book. Why are you talking about a game? You know, what I'm trying to say is you've got to be more diplomatic, you know, both in terms of the party. You don't want to piss off everyone. You don't want to piss off the Democrats and Republicans. You want some of those people to side with you because when the book comes out, that's going to determine how many of those publications the media is going to write reviews, whether it's going to be Washington Times, 
if you're siding with the Republicans or is it going to be New York Times? And uh, so you have to be diplomatic. And I said, you know what? Diplomatic and whistleblowers, they're like oxymoron to me. Because if you're a diplomatic person, you wouldn't blow the whistle in the first place. You go and make yourself a really nice, cushy career, and you join the criminal cabal. It is ironic that it has been six centuries since Johannes Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press, freeing the masses to access the printed word for the first time. And we are once again at a spot where the printed word can be so thoroughly controlled and restricted. However, thanks to the internet and print-on-demand technologies, our own version of the Gutenberg revolution, the self-publishing industry is not only a viable alternative for suppressed and dangerous works, but often the only outlet for books that truly challenge the status quo. And now, as we edge closer to the nightmare dystopia of Bradbury's 451, we must ask whether those brave souls who dare to challenge this system of control toil in vain to bring this information to the public. Because ultimately, if the efforts of whistleblowers and truth-tellers like Sibel Edmonds go unrewarded, even this last hope for circumventing the systems of state censorship may be squelched out of existence, not by force, but by the apathy of a public that is more content to be distracted by entertainment than to stand up for the public's right to know. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com. It's really phenomenal to me that any court could look at her case and say, no, it can't go forward. Turkey was being investigated by the CIA. It may have been a front for the U.S. intelligence service. The entire case is a state secret. That's what this whistleblower network is about. It's saying enough is enough. The people that I've talked to about these tapes are extremely nervous. Today, we are facing despots who use national security and classification to push everything under a blanket of secrecy. To gag and call it a privilege. Unless we recognize these attacks for what they are and stand up and speak out, no, shout out against those despots in government, then we are doomed to wake up one sad morning and wonder when and where our freedom died. Thank you.